Hello, Black Hollywood Live fans. Today on Justice is Served, the first black person convicted of lynching and white privilege rears its ugly head. Join us for that and more on Justice is Served. You are tuned in to Black Hollywood Live. Justice is Served. Hello, fans of Justice. Welcome to Justice is Served with me, Chelsea Galicia, and Shaka Smith, and our new co-host, Yemi Abayami. Thank you so much both for being here. Yemi, you were here last week when I was off in the, the jungle. Thank you for coming back. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you for coming. Shaka did not scare you off. It's fantastic. And uh, you've got quite an impressive background. And um, she comes from here in LA and then lost school in, in Virginia. Virginia and then you graduated right around the same time I did you were in 2009 mm -hmm. and then you worked for NBC Universal in legal affairs yes before deciding to go on a trip around the world yeah or, I'm a love of tra a, a, a traveler at heart so guilty which would explain my absence <laughs> in the last two weeks so uh, thank you so much for being here welcome yeah. thank you welcome welcome glad to be here all right, unfortunately we have a disturbing story to start with. Uh, this is uh, Jasmine Richards. She is a Black Lives Matter organizer out of Pasadena, California, who has just been convicted of lynching. So much to say about this. The very first part for me to say about this is that I am shocked and saddened and kind of ashamed that this is happening in Pasadena. Pasadena is right next door to my hometown of La Cunada, which is so teeny tiny that when people out in the world ask me where I'm from, I generally just say Pasadena because people know where that is. And my mom now lives in Pasadena. I'm in Pasadena all the time. I was ju there just this morning. So for that this to happen so close to home, you know, it's, it's almost one thing when it happens across the country and other places with a long history of racism and suppression of minorities that this was a little bit of a slap in the face. Yeah. And then the charge and conviction mm -hmm. that a young lady who was convicted of lynching, certainly when I think of lynching and you think of lynching, we think of people dying, at, yeah. being hung, mm -hmm. and due this, to their race, yeah. Right. And strictly because they were black. Yeah. Right? So um, the same laws were used against Jasmine Richards. How did this happen? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's so unfortunate. So she's out there protesting uh, Kendrick McDade, a 19-year-old uh, uh, black guy unarmed that was shot by the police. And so she's out there protesting, and apparently another black woman is being arrested by the police or having some altercation due to possibly leaving a restaurant and not paying. She and some other members go over there and to try to help this woman and, during, and eventually leaves. And so two days later, they go to arrest her and they accuse her of lynching because according to them under their statute, lynching is the taking of a person or obstruction of a person from police custody. Right. And so it qualified under that and however, it's happened before people have qualified for this charge, but it's always been dropped. And with her, they decided to make an example of her and uh, give her this felony charge. Uh, do you have a personal opinion about why they went so hard on this young lady? I mean, that, that was my question as well. As Ashaka mentioned, people have been charged with this in the past. It's happened. It's not unusual. But no one's ever actually been... Uh, convicted of it and you know much less an African-American to be convicted of it it's actually almost it almost is somewhat of a, a perverse result because you have this law that was intended to protect African-Americans from you know mobs and, and, and being hung and, and here you have someone who's actually um, out in the park at Pasadena advocating for you know, Black Lives Matter um, and supporting black civil rights and civil li civil liberties to be prosecuted under this law, convicted under this law. It's, it's, it's just a very uncomfortable thing to witness. And then even her, her sentence that goes along with it, the, the probation department recommended a year um, for this, uh, for, this, for you know, t re helping to remove someone from police custody. It just seems a, it seems a bit egregious. Which she, they didn't even successfully do. Yeah. So apparently <clears throat> there, is, there is a video that you can kind of see, it was cell phone video, and you see a large group of police officers handling a young woman, and people are yelling out to the officers, hey, she's a petite little girl, like you, not talking about Jasmine, talking about 
the person that's being arrested, don't please don't be so rough with her. They're trying to just get the cops to chill a little. If they want to arrest her, fine. They're saying she's cooperating, like just take it easy on her. And then I guess the cops are still being pretty aggressive. And so then Jasmine goes to try and help, you know, get help the woman stand up or, or and that was uh, just too much. It's she's trying to remove her from being arrested, which she didn't. The woman was arrested, and, so and I'm, they had charges for that. They they charged her with a riot. They charged her with child endangerment, delaying and obstructing peace officers. They end up dropping those charges because those are misdemeanors, and they wanted to get her for the felony. And I think why you see that it hadn't been ever gone gone to trial. Those charges had been dropped in the past is because they respected the spirit of the law. And here, they're violating the spirit of the law. This was not what the law was designed to uh, prevent. It is really ironic because, you know, the shooting of unarmed black men primarily is being called the modern day lynching. Yep. And so now to have the lynching law be re sort of categorized, be reused. So the reason why it's even, we're even using the term lynching is because it's, that's the same law, except the law is no longer term, like called lynching. Governor Jerry Brown changed it to say that it's when you're trying to remove somebody who is in police custody yeah. from there. So uh, I, 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 I just, I was totally dumbfounded. I was wondering if anybody else found anything that made this make a little bit more sense? Was there anything that you saw that made this make any legal sense to it, either of you? You know, as I read more about this story, I found more information that made it even make less sense. Mm -hmm. So this happened in the park one afternoon. At the end of the day, they were able to arrest the lady who was accused of leaving the restaurant without, um, without paying for her meal. It wasn't until the following day that the police then went back, perhaps after re reviewing this video where it's even hard to see exactly what's going on, but they went back and that's when they started making arrests. And so their first arrest was for an 11-year-old boy who had also been present. Um, who, they charged him with a resisting arrest and um, I guess kicking a police vehicle. And even a witness said, oh, he just tapped the car, but he was charged with it. This is an 11-year-old kid. And then they made the arrest of Jasmine Richards and we know they also um, made arrests of three other individuals, all under the age of 16, for various charges in connection with this quote unquote riot um, as the police were trying to arrest, uh, arrest this That was another girl. very weird part because one of the requirements is that it, there's a riot going on. That's part of, so I don't know how looking at that video, and there was a police video that I haven't seen, how anybody would call that a riot. Well, I believe it only requires um, two people, more than two people. Uh, you know, we there was actually one... The definition of a riot. Yeah. That's interesting. I didn't know that. And there was actually one young lady, I believe it was, uh, was it Tiffany Tran, who that was almost put on trial for lynching herself, but they ended up dropping the charge. So does it seem fair to say that this is completely political, that they nabbed the person who organized the Black Lives Matter chapter in Pasadena yeah. and wanted to make a statement that you better not maybe exercise your 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 freedom to well I think that's the whole thing I think the black lives protest and yeah I think the black lives matter um, movement in some ways has been demonized and I think it scares people I think mm -hmm. it probably scares cities um, I think that the way it's been categorized a lot of times people don't know what it's going to look like so they they are doing their utmost to kind of preempt it yeah. and in doing so they're chilling activism yeah, it is. Um, it's pretty terrible, and it's gotten me thinking how I could personally um, go down to City Hall and see. You know, I I don't know what is going on. I wonder who's paying for her her legal bills to maybe help with that because um, I don't know. This is just so. I, I cannot see the fairness, the justice in this and at I, all. And Especially when you have people that are acting out kind of in the defense of this woman who's being manhandled by police at that point in time. Um, and you can hear them in the video saying, she's so small, she's petite. You know, be careful with her, so on and so yeah. forth. So to classify that that as a riot when it's really kind of exercising concern for your fellow citizen, yeah. who, mind you, at the time, so the restaurant owner, yes, had accused her of leaving the restaurant um, without paying. We don't know whether that was the case as of yet. Right. I mean, she was not guilty yet, right. such that the eyes of the law. It's really it's a, you know kind of a he said she said situation. Or I, yeah. I don't know that the police had done you know investigation at that point in time. Um, but then it does speak to the fact that even when you have 
people of color um, trying to help a situation, there's something in our heads or in people's heads that you know, black people being kind of vocal about rights is equated with violence and inciting a riot. And then to use that um, and be prosecuted under this quote unquote and lynching law, the optics of it are just and like, I think terrible. It's, I think it's part of where she was, because in Pasadena the population is only 13.4% black. So there were, there were no black people on the jury, but I think the fact that they're a very small population in Pasadena, they may have been more afraid of Black Lives Matter than you know, than an, another city that... Unfortunately, yeah. I think you're probably onto something, have, having grown up right in that population where there is, there are not very many black people. Um, there are not very many minorities, really, at all. Um, the people that I went to, to school with, the only other, you know, Mexican or, or Latin were the kids of the housekeepers that lived in the in the city. So um, I, I, th I think it is probably fair to say that the population who is likely on the jury is a group that is conservative yeah. and probably uh, a bit afraid of the the of the of the movement. Yeah. To be frank, um, the 90-day sentence. I mean, at least it's not a year. I don't know yeah. if there's any you know consolation. Like at least it's not a year. So she's got 90 days, but she's already served 18 days, mm -hmm. uh, and then she's got three years probation which is probably the more frightening part because probation is so it's so easy yeah. to find somebody who is in violation of, of probation that it can get her caught in the cycle of the system for for better yeah. and, and once it's a great way to kind of take out someone who's leading this movement in Pasadena so yeah. it's unfortunate I, I do want to add I do believe that one of the reasons I read this. One of the reasons why she might have gotten that 90-day sentence as well is because she had violated probation on a previous oh, previous that's matter. I had not. Um, so I think that might have also impacted the sentence. Okay. Well, that that's that part's interesting. I hadn't come across anything about her about her history. Um, so she'll serve 90 days, essentially three months, and that's effectively what a convicted rapist is going to um, be serving. We're now talking about the story of Brock Turner. He is the Stanford swimmer who was convicted of rape and given a six-month sentence, but with good behavior, he could be out in as little as three months. So many layers of this story to talk about. First, like, just the, the facts. This guy was convicted of raping an unconscious woman. Yeah. Um, two other students caught him in the act and confronted him, talked to him for a second. Mm -hmm. Then he, Brock Turner, tried to run off. One of the, the students got him and they held on to him until cops arrived. He decided to go take his chances on a jury trial. The jury came back and convicted him of felony you know, three felonies. rape, three uh, unconscious so, for an object. Yeah, so it was, a, it was assault with intent to rape, um, and then two assaults that uh, dealt with the digital penetration of the victim. So uh, pretty, you know, heinous. His his defense was that he was drunk too, yeah. and she was awake the whole time. But the witnesses, the other students who came by, said they very clearly saw that she was not moving. Yeah, and his and his story changed over time, which was, you know, just speaks to what was taking place. Uh, so unfortunately. So she goes to a party, she drinks away too much, and these two students, they realize that she's unconscious when, when they happen upon the scenes to behind a dumpster. Mm -hmm. And so it, here he is behind a dumpster doing this to this unconscious girl, and he takes off. He doesn't turn around and say, oh, no, no, you know, we're fine, this is my girlfriend, or this is who I'm with. Because if you truly felt you were doing nothing wrong, why would you just run and bolt? And so the fact that they had to hold him down, so initially he said he didn't remember much of the night either. And it wasn't until later that he found out she had very little recollection of the night that he started to fill in blanks mm -hmm. of, oh, you said yes to the dancing with me on the dance floor and that you wanted to come home to my dorm room. Right. So nobody believed him on the jury. Yeah. Uh, and he was convicted, uh, could have faced 14 years. Yeah. Prosecution recommended six years. And... Uh, the judge gave him six months. Six months, and which he'll only it, serve effectively about three months of it. Right. right. So this, the the reason that the judge gave is that um, that this would have a significant impact on his life. Um, the judge 
was a Stanford athlete himself. Some yeah. people are saying that they saw, that the judge saw too much of the defendant in himself, or some the other way around, uh, and that's why he was so lenient. Um, the other shocking part of this story, which isn't so much legal, but it's very interesting because it explains the mindset of the individual, is Brock Turner's dad's reaction and the statement that he released to the public. That was, yeah, disappointing. Yeah, I, I mean, all of it, all of it almost works together. You have this kid who f feels very comfortable, it seems. He never admitted to what he did, even though two witnesses saw him in the act. Um, and the physical evidence demonstrates that something obviously happened to this victim. Um, the Brock, he has never admitted to what he did. Right, um, so he just said he got drunk. Right, yeah. he That's got his drunk. only crime. We danced. She, she was con conscious at the time, or he didn't realize that she was unconscious. So you have uh, this person who's not still, uh, still not yet accepting responsibility for his action. Then you have that compounded by the fact that you do have a judge who was also captain of the lacrosse team. He himself was a student an athlete at a prestigious school and the same the, one the same one yeah. The, yeah. the same prestigious school and you know I can relate to this kid he probably didn't mean anything by it you know, everyone has mistakes I mean really really sympathizing with someone that he can relate and to this and, is just like we're watching the ingredients of white privilege all, all mixed yeah. together in a pot it's, it's really amazing so that's how we, we saw the justice you know aspect of it or the legal aspect of it, the judge being very, very incredibly sympathetic, probably because they related to him. It, yeah. mm -hmm. And then we watched how this happens when you have a father that says, this is um, a steep price. This is like a quote, a steep price to pay for 20 minutes of action in a 20 year life. What was your reaction to that? And I, I thought, it's a steep, pay, steep price to pay for the victim. For 20 minutes of action, her life is now ruined, you know? And yeah. in many ways, she's going to have to deal with the effects and of this for years. how many other crimes could be committed in 20 minutes? Yeah. How many people are sitting yeah. in prison for actions that took much less than 20 minutes? Yeah. Uh, I, that, that kind of logic, I I was like, maybe did this father go to Trump University? Because <laughs> I don't know, where do they teach this kind of logic that for 20 minutes you shouldn't be that damaged because you right. know, the rest of your 20 years life was stellar? Which, by the way, do you think rape is an entry-level crime? Or you think uh, this kid must have gotten away with a lot of other uh, things because nobody ever told him no? Either so that or this was certainly going to be the beginning of doing that. I mean, I don't think you do this once. I think it, this happens and you go out and you get drunk and you find the next unconscious girl and the next unconscious girl, so. I, did you have something else, else uh, to add to that? No, I mean, I, I, one thing that I just thought was so interesting was the fact that, so as you mentioned, the father's talking about what a steep price this is to pay and the judge is saying it's not fair that he should have his whole life kind of uprooted from him. And all of the comments that you would expect to, uh, all of the sympathizing that you would expect to be hearing for the victim, these are actually words that are going towards the defense of the defendant, the person who was actually convicted of committing this crime. I mean, it's 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 unreal. It's unbelievable. And um, the father feels so bad for him that he's lost his appetite and won't ever enjoy the steak same. the same way again. Yeah. I, I and initially the victim was in favor of leniency. Initially the victim said in her statement that she wanted this to be over with. That you know. A, a heavy apology from him, maybe some sort of like jail time, maybe six months or something initially. But he said he wasn't sorry. He wasn't, you know. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to use this uh, experience to go and speak to schools about drinking, rape, not even rape culture, yeah. drinking and promiscuity. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was he's no the promiscuity. Authority now, yeah. right? I'm, he doesn't get it at all. And, so when people yeah. like, you're, like, this is just not getting it at all, in the least, and then we have a really great story to sort of contrast this with. Although I do want to say yeah. before we switch topics that not, so he got this very lenient, very light sentence. I think most people in society would agree that this is a very light sentence. He's still going back and appealing yes. the decision, saying, no, I shouldn't have been convicted for anything yeah. in the first place. And one thing I really do want to highlight is this this treatment that he's gotten from the judge and his father about you know how this is going to ruin his life life. I mean, think about other African-American uh, defendants who don't get that same this is luxury. exactly what I was going to say uh, when I was mention, wanted to mention the, the, another story of a 19-year-old football player at Vanderbilt 
who raped an unconscious woman was convicted of three felony counts, so just, you know, like uh, Brock Turner, uh, aggravated rape and two counts of sexual battery. Face, it was convicted and then it has 15 years minimum that he will serve or 25 maximum. Now, I don't know the criminal history of this person whose uh, background I'm reading, but Corey Beatty is a black man who was in the same situation, same crime, and look at the disparity in the sentencing. I, I don't know if somebody who before has claimed that white privilege doesn't exist can defend it now when there are such contrasting stories of so similar circumstances. Yeah. And, and there was also a case with Brian Banks, who was a 16-year-old um, football player at his high school. He was accused of rape by a 15-year-old. He spent six years, in, or sorry, five years, uh, he spent five years in jail for a rape that he didn't even commit. He had no criminal history, no priors, no nothing. It was just the word of this girl who later, recanted. years later, recanted. Yeah. But in his case, there was no sympathy offered by the judge who said, oh, but he's only 16. We don't want to upset his life. He's done such a good, a good job on the football field. I mean, remember, even when uh, the newspapers were reporting about Brock Turner, everything was, they were all talking about, he's such a distinguished swimmer, he yeah. could have gone to the Olympics, he goes to Stanford, he's smart. All of these details humanizing who he the, was. The really nice picture of him, his yearbook the face, picture. Yeah. The, the yearbook Instead picture. They the actually, they took a while to reveal that mug, to reveal the mugshot. They had yeah. to really lobby to get that mugshot out it's there. true. Yeah. And yeah. when you have that same, the, the, the reporting a similar type of case, of an African American or someone of color, oftentimes it is the the police booking mugshot and any articles that are written. I mean, very very sparse details about you know their their family lives and their home lives and experiences. Nothing to humanize them. Um, and so I think you have that not even just in media, but we see this as well in in the um, in the judicial system in terms of the judge's ability to relate to these um, to these defendants and the lenience that they're going to show in one case versus. And this case another. is worse because. Because you know, with rape victims, we keep their identity private. So really, the media had everything they could with Brock and being able to humanize him, and not doing that on behalf of the victim. Yeah, um, I, 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 the only I don't know. Well, there's two, a couple of things. First of all, even though he's only going to serve about three months, he will have to register as a sex offender for the rest of his life. And generally, I have an issue with the some of the, the, the laws around the sex offender registration, but in this case, I think it's well warranted. Yeah. Anybody else have a different opinion here that the, okay. he should Because I, I, I'm not sure, but I think that the reason he is appealing is because, you know, the worst part of this sentence is that he, the rest of his life he's going to be impacted about, you know, where he can yeah. live. He can't be near a school. He can't, you know, those just lots as she, of things. But just as the rest of her life is going to be impacted by it? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. So oh. that I, I think is the is the main basis for seeking an appeal. But, yeah. it, but I think hopefully the case at large brings a more a talk about athlete culture and college campuses because a lot of that stuff is almost permissive and it's not uncommon to hear that some girls accuse someone on your team of this or that and it never goes anywhere. These yeah. are just rumors. But it, it's really important. It, one of the things the victim said in her statement was, "Rape is not the absence of promiscuity; it's the absence of consent." Yeah. And so it's not the absence of alcohol. It's not the absence of yeah. you know poor decisions. Decisions, but it's the absence of consent, and yeah. so I think students need to get that message. I do think everyone. that per, you know probably the best thing that's come out of this situation is the victim statement. If yeah. you have not read the whole thing in full, please go do that. Yeah. Uh, an anchor woman on CNN spent 35 minutes, which is an eternity mm -hmm. on the airtime, reading it word for word, yeah. and it really helps to put yourself in that 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 situation. I have not personally been involved in anything like this, and when I hear of a woman drunk unconscious um, it, it's not that I no longer see her as a victim but I see her as like kind of like different from me because I don't I, I, I can't ever remember drinking to the extent where I was unconscious so I uh, there's some break there in understanding but the way that she explained it you know she's like the girl that goes to a party in a beige sweater just because you know she wanted to hang out with her sister I'm like mm. oh yeah I'm totally the girl in the beige sweater we'll just mm. you know go somewhere just because it's a place to hang out with somebody and then sure you know maybe one time I intended to have one drink and then 
got drunk, maybe not blackout, but the way that she worded her uh, the, the statement, brilliantly written, so that I don't know if anybody could come away from that statement and not feel that they relate to her yeah. in some way. And, and the consequence of blacking out and going unconscious should not be rape. That, that should not be on the table as a consequence. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I think it's hard for some people, maybe even people like me who have a hard time, even though she's a woman, relating to somebody who... Um, because you think, well, maybe, you know, she sort of put herself in a weird situation. I mean, it's terrible yeah. to even have to think about that. But it's like in in this in this world, you got to always be careful and, and on guard. And, you know, I, I hate, I would hate, would hate, hate to sound like I am victim blaming at all in the least. But I'm just saying that for me personally, it caused me to, to relate a little bit less until I read the full statement and really understood her, the story, the full experience, because yeah. I have no idea what any of that is like. How when you like wake up from that in the hospital and, and the pictures that they do and the testing that they do on you and how invasive it is. This was behind a dumpster. It wasn't like, you know, it, it, I think sometimes you get these stories and there are elements where you wonder if there was some consent in some shape, way, or form. But this was the most egregious type of non-consent. Yeah. Absolutely. And usually, with rape victims, usually remaining anonymous, and also, oftentimes, you know, they don't want to kind of recount the event and, and relive it. This is one of the few windows that we actually get into, you know, what does rape look like and feel like? What are the mm -hmm. impacts? It was and like, what, what is it like right after? Mm -hmm. And she talked yeah. about even having to tell her parents and her boyfriend and not mm -hmm. wanting to, and I, I just... Uh, really remarkable. I think uh, I've seen online that people shared it and said that this should be required reading. Oh, yeah, I think sure. it yeah ninth grade, it should be required reading for yeah. everybody. Re absolutely. Okay, uh, well, we're going to leave that story behind and change things up quite a bit. I'm going to read you a message from our supporter, FreshBooks. Thank you so much, FreshBooks, for supporting Justice is Served. Yeah. So, small business owners, probably like myself, like all yeah. of us here, right? It's time to be honest about how you feel when dealing with your day-to-day -day admin work. Ugh. Admit it, you can't stand it. It's a total grind. So mm. true. The truth is, over 5 million small business owners felt exactly the same way until they discovered FreshBooks. For those of you who haven't heard about FreshBooks, listen up. These folks are on a serious mission to help small business owners save time and avoid a lot of the stress that comes with running their business. FreshBooks is the dead simple cloud account Accounting software that's transforming how business owners handle their paperwork. Using FreshBooks to create and send an invoice literally takes about 30 seconds. There's no formulas or formatting, just perfectly crafted invoices every time. Your clients can pay you online, which often means you end up getting paid a lot faster. That's nice. That's, nice. that's a super, and there's a super handy feature for deposits so you can invoice for a payment upfront when you're kicking off a project. FreshBooks can even show you whether or not a client has looked at the invoice you emailed. Ooh, it's oh, like that's it. They can't hide behind. I never got you it. You saw it with my money. This is only a fraction of what FreshBooks can do for you. FreshBooks has created a super intuitive tool that makes creating and sending invoices extremely simple. It's fast, all online with instant notifications. Plus, send automatic late payment reminders and you can create custom custom branding to reflect your business. You owe it to yourself to feel the full effect of FreshBooks on you and your small business. Plus, if you have any questions, their customer service is absolutely fantastic. No robots, real people. They care so much that if for some reason after four rings someone from customer service can't pick up your call, your call will be routed to all employees at FreshBooks so you're guaranteed to get help. For a 30-day free trial, just go to freshbooks.com forward slash geek. That's G-E-E. K and enter geek nerd tech. Hey, that's me. In the <laughs> how did you hear about us section. Thank you so much, FreshBooks, for supporting uh, Justice again. We really do appreciate that. And that is how we are able to bring you Justice is Served every week for free. All right, moving on now to uh, the gorilla story. Wow, yeah, it's been... <laughs> a wrong <beat. laughs> We can't escape it. Can we can't escape it. So this is uh, the, the three-year-old boy that escaped his mother's grasp and ended up in the gorilla exhibit at the Cincinnati Zoo and he, Harambe, was shot and killed um, to apparently save the young boy. There's a huge uproar. Um, do we want to uh, 
to, to see the video, which kind of, for me, changed the way that I saw this. Yeah. Do we have that available? So, is it up and going? Yeah, so it looks like that's a video. Oh, here we go. Thank you. I mean, I, I get this whole thing about that they want the exhibits to be like open air, so it's like as close to a real life experience as seeing them in nature. But then, this three-year-old is able to get into the enclosure and then be dragged around by the and he did, and the three-year-old did have to do some work. So it wasn't like just you could just walk in. He did have to kind of he, maneuver his way yeah. through several different areas There's to get fence, down. There's a fence, and then he had to crawl through the bushes, which initially actually made me a little bit more skeptical. Uh, I, I know on Facebook there were kind of like wars of people who felt like the parents were irresponsible um, versus those who said, oh, but I'm a parent and I know how fast children are and how easily yeah. they're able to get away. And I, I, and I doubt she ever thought he could get into the enclosure. It didn't, probably didn't even look like it was possible from her vantage. And I think people were really surprised at how quickly it happened. Wow. I mean, there was a fence, a three-foot fence that he crawled through. He went through bushes and then fell oh down my this goodness. moat. Yeah. And initially, my thought was, well, if it, even if it happened so fast, aren't the, the mothers there? Aren't there other patrons that would see him and just be like, boy, you know, come So come it must have been here. quick enough that that didn't take place. Oh, you know? and... Well, apparently, even though a lot of people were up in arms and really upset that the gorilla died as a result of this, um, law enforcement has found that there are is no grounds to bring criminal charges against the mother of the boy. And they cited surveillance video and witnesses, which is nice because I think people needed to hear that, listen, this is not her fault because everyone just went in on the mom. Yeah. I, I, well, it was interesting. She was. They, they said that she was there with that boy, but three also other kids. Also watching other kids, yeah. I, I, maybe there should be like a one adult <laughs> per child rule with the children on a leash because, oh my God, what a terrifying experience that is. I, I don't know anything yeah, about but I think you. Was, I think you assume the zoo is doing the work of protecting us from the animals. You know, I, I, I know there's lions and tigers in the zoo, so I assume the zoo is doing their utmost to make sure we're not attacked and that... I mean, it sounds like yeah. it wasn't easy for the kid to, to get in. I, I, I don't know, but I, you know, I'm, I guess a one adult f with four children, yeah. especially one that's three years old, probably not a good idea and probably should be against policy. Yeah. Well, oh, well, well, I, well, yeah. I, well, I wouldn't well, go that far. Yeah, I wouldn't go that far. But, yeah. Really? Oh my gosh! <laughs> you think I can't? I can't imagine. I mean, I'm not a parent. I don't know, but I can't yeah. imagine one person watching four children I think I've gone in a on... big, vast space that includes wild animals. No, but I know it's possible because I've gone on school field trips as a kid, and it was like 15 of us to two but chaperones. Three. Yeah. But, that, but that was a three-year-old. You weren't in preschool when I, you went. Maybe or, eight or seven. I still wasn't like you know a fully. Formed I, I understand what you're saying. It is a handful, and it turns out, so, so the mother was there with her uh, four children, three of whom, well, all of them actually were between the ages of one to seven, so they were all very, very oh, young. Oh, my gosh. One of the children was one, the boy is three, the oldest is seven, um, and there's a third, chi a fourth child as well. So she was definitely dealing with a young group that, which is, mm. yeah, it's tough for one person. Um, and, you know, the, the police officer said uh, after the investigation that, she t did turn her attention to one of the children um, for a few seconds. It was just a few seconds, and you can see apparently in the surveillance video this child just scampering off. It was, you know, it was too quick. Um, and you know, it, it doesn't only happen in the zoo though, because really, if you restricted, you know, a person's ability to carry so many children in the zoo, the same thing can happen when you're walking your children across the street. Yeah. For, you know, to, to, to from the park, you know, to get to the car. Uh, they run and they're quick and it, it, apparently it happens. So, sure, yeah, I totally understand that, but if I was a zoo, I would say more, you know, child-adult uh, ratio may need to be looked at. The interesting part of this story, you know, not just the, the, the lack of uh, charges, I'm not particularly surprised mm -hmm. that there are no, no yeah. charges. One of the very interesting comments that was made during the press conference was, in defense of the mother, uh, the person giving the press conference said, it's not like she was in the bathroom smoking crack. Was yeah. anybody else, like, did a, like a, did he, or, did he <laughs> yeah. really just say that? And, and what did you guys think of that comment? Uh, it, it made me cringe, because it's coming from the prosecutor, the, Ham uh, the Hamilton County prosecutor here, so, 
the fact that he just took that image and that was what he juxtaposed <laughs> it with was a little disturbing because it makes you wonder if that's what's what people view if you're not if you're a black woman who hasn't and we presume you haven't taken care of your kids is it that you were then just smoking crack in the back <laughs> without the right the surveillance why, why was or the that witnesses? the automatic yeah. um kind of association there he could have said <sighs> anything oh well thank goodness it wasn't like she, she was, was texting or posting on facebook right. or something yeah. like that a anything i mean there's a whole universe a universe Other of drugs examples that she could have been drugs using any, yeah. you know, not just like the most right yeah. in the bathroom i'm sorry for there's laughing too because much, it's um, really not yeah. Yeah. A, a lot of racial racial subtext yes. there. Maybe maybe not even intentional because he. Well, a lot he, of it isn't intentional. You know. Right. I mean, he had been speaking about no, this woman is not, was not a danger to her children. Um, she was very attentive to the children. Um, just turned around for a few moments. The child was just too fast. Really saying all of these things in defense of her, um, in defense of uh, you know from the people who were claiming that she was just this unfit. And then it, to go from that kind of nice fluffy wording to but she was in crack in the bathroom. But, but he may have used that because maybe that's where he feels a lot of the criticism was. Coming coming from because a lot of people because a lot of the stuff against the mom was very racist when you look at online and what people were commenting um, so I think he may have also just been calling out those people that were saying look she's not someone smoking crack in the bathroom okay you know like we, very like, nicely done we in have surveillance the we have witnesses so I, I think that might have also been I'm hoping that's why he used that phrase because of the sort of backlash of racist comments <laughs> you know, like, I just oh, wish he would I, I just wish so. he would have stopped yeah. at she was With attentive yeah. Yeah. Or, or saying <laughs> according to the people out out there, you know, at least he could have made it more of a distance between himself. But I'm going to assume maybe that's the reason he used that terminology. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Subtle racism. Okay. Uh, well, there was not so subtle racism in the case of Timothy Foster. Um, this <laughs> story uh, is about a black man who was convicted Tyrone of killing. Foster, yeah? uh, I Timothy. thought it was Timothy Tyrone, Tyrone, Tyrone Foster. Foster. Oh, okay who was convicted of killing a white woman in 1987 and currently sits on death row in Georgia. He took his case to the Supreme Court uh, claiming racial discrimination at his trial. And it turns out that some like 20 years later, his attorneys found notes from the prosecutors that had the letter B next to potential jurors who were black and notes that, that you know make sure that we get them off the the panel and that maybe if there is one black person maybe this is the one okay so a lot of notes referencing race yeah okay interesting it would be really interesting if we could see prosecutors notes on every case right so the the supreme court virtually unanimously I say virtually because it's seven to one decision, which I don't remember <laughs> ever in law school seeing a seven to one decision. Mm. Has anybody else here seen no. any oh, kind yeah. of, I mean, it's usually very close. Maybe you'll see like a, a, a three to six, but nothing seven to one. I mean, so the not only is that interesting, but then the lone wolf dissenter. Yeah. Anybody else here surprised that it was the lone black justice on the <laughs> United States Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas? You know, so initially when I read this story, I was to not surprised. Here we go again, Clarence, Th Clarence yeah. Thomas. You know what's his issue? It, it was surprised, not surprised. You were like, oh man, really, <laughs> really? <laughs> um, because. Initially, upon uh, upon you know reading the the case, basically the case involved the use of peremptory challenges, um, which are you don't have to give a cause for why you're striking a juror from the jury. You can just say just because. Um, but still, there are restrictions and limitations on that. You can't simply um, strike a juror on account of race. And in this instance, you know the 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 notes of the prosecutors reflected that it seems that though as though these um, jurors were dismissed on account of race and so you, you kind of over have this overarching view of this case of oh you know every every judge should be against um, using racial bases to to strike jurors uh, which I agree with and and so you have why is why is Clarence Thomas disagreeing what 
made me actually a bit more comfortable was in in reading his his dissent. Oh my god, <laughs> God bless you, because I tried and I was like, what? I, okay. I can't even. I, yeah, I had to read it because I was like, I, I need to. I, I wanted okay. to find uh, something why, to read. You guys are better human beings than I am because I tried to, and I was just like, I cannot read this BS. But I, okay, we maybe a little bit of redemption. Yeah, so he got halfway there, halfway yeah. there. To me, yeah. please, so I don't he, get he it. He dissented on two grounds. The first of, of which was a procedural ground saying yeah. that the Supreme Court didn't even have jurisdiction to be hearing this matter. Um, it was litigated in the in the Georgia courts, went up to the Georgia Supreme Court, um, didn't raise a federal question, the Supreme Court doesn't have jurisdiction, and that's why I... And that's what he rested largely upon was that idea. And, and so that, at least, I was comfortable with yeah. as a matter of law. Reasonable minds could disagree as to whether it raised a, a federal question or whether the Supreme Court had jurisdiction. So I was like, okay, Clarence. Eh, <laughs> meh, yeah. I'm not sold, yeah. but, but okay. <laughs> but unfortunately, then we get to, the, to his second point. His second point, which also has some redeeming factors and, and some less redeeming but he, factors. He couldn't just avoid <laughs> waiting into the minutia of the case. But, but yeah. His second point was that you're supposed to give, you know, even as the Supreme Court, you're supposed to give substantial deference to the findings of the trial court. And he was saying that here we are 20 years, 30 years later, trying to reevaluate um, what the trial court saw as you, uh, uh, a race-neutral reason for using these but peremptory... But they didn't have the notes back then. Uh, using no, these yeah. peremptory challenges. So, but he, he, his argument is that the, the trial court judges, the, 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 the judge was there, he saw the evidence, he, he was able to look yeah. in the eyes of the of the prosecutor who's And saying, determine that the prosecutor wasn't racist? He's saying it's it's easier it's, <laughs> yeah, easy, it's easier to reach a conclusion if you're there and present at the, the time, time it, versus yeah. 30 years later yeah. trying to establish that, oh no, there was a racial bias. So that's that's his argument um, that you know you have to give substantial deference, which which is I think fair. The um, the problem the problem yeah. with it is is the fact that you do have these notes from the prosecutor. So he completely ignores them, basically. I, th I think he's <laughs> saying they don't know to what extent those notes played in actual jury selection, and if the court that was there sitting there determined that they didn't, or not the notes, but that there were that there was no question of race at the time. Then they're the best, the best person to make the decision because they were there. Uh, but I get I, no. Well, well I Sorry. think I think that's part of the flaw because if you're alleging racism and you're alleging it in a pattern from '87, that's the problem. Is that that took place at a time when these attitudes were there. So how do you have them find that there, everything was race neutral when we're living in that moment where they are where they aren't themselves race neutral? Yeah, I don't understand how he ignores the notes so much. He, yeah. And that's the thing. That's what kind of made me say, oh, wait, okay, here's the, here's the old if Clarence we, that yeah. I know because... <laughs> Because you're right, he he dismisses the notes essentially, saying that well, you know, people's memories are hazy. Not yeah, that's everyone why we're could remember. Yeah. Not everyone <laughs> could remember who wrote what. Y you know, in the notes, as we said, you have uh, black jurors' names highlighted. You have the um, the prosecutor saying, oh, well, we didn't we struck this black juror because this one was divorced. But then there are white jurors that were selected that were also divorced, or we, you know, um, struck this black juror because uh, the person was too young. But then they selected um, other jurors who were were younger, and so that's one of the things that the Supreme Court mentions is that there were all these contradictions in these presumed race-neutral bases for striking these jurors. So Clarence Thomas t tends to overlook it and say, oh, it's, it's not so clear that that's exactly why, and in any event, it really doesn't matter why they, they should be peremptory challenges, so long as they're able to name a reason, um, that should be it. Yeah. Which this is just really showing one of the worst parts of our judicial system. Yeah, he's basically right here, saying, challenges. "Here you are as a racist, so I'm going to trust you as a racist to determine whether or not you're being racist." That's essentially what he's <laughs> saying to do. I need to watch that new um, the HBO show. Um, uh, what was it called? Confirmation. Yes. The, oh, about, and then near to hell. Uh, uh, about the, him. Yes. I, yes. I, I need to understand the mind of this man. 
I, yeah. it's, it's, well, I think all of us would like to understand yeah, his mind. I mean, he seems little. to have had a, it's a, an interesting background that he has, and it's a, it's a great story in the sense that he did grow up impoverished. Um, he was sent to live. He didn't grow up with his mother after, I think, the age of seven. He was sent to live with his grandfather, who raised him. I mean, and, but when he was living with his mother, lived in poverty, it wasn't until that he, he moved with his grandfather that, um, you know, he had regular electricity and running water. I mean, this was a, um, a city outside of Savannah, Georgia, back in the 19, who knows, 50s Interesting. Or he so. comes from the same state that this case comes from. That's yeah. true, um, and so, but he was able to work work through um, his difficulties, the taunting at school, made his way to, to Yale, did very well there. Clearly, he's now a Supreme Court justice, and so part of me, when I read his opinions, that I get the sense that he feels like, look, I did it, I made it. I yeah. did it on my own. And in a time that was maybe more difficult. Right. Yeah. So, you know, stop complaining, pick yourself up by the bootstraps mentality, and that is pervades his um, his opinions yeah. and his sometimes some, what some people would look at as a lack of sympathy yeah. or empathy for, um, for, for minorities, especially in these civil rights cases. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you so much for providing that, that background. I think it's... Um, interesting to know about that part. The, uh, this, this decision by the Supreme Court, though, does not exonerate or get this man off of death row. It just gives him the right to, to a new, new trial. trial yeah. Yeah. All right. So we have talked often and at length about um, police shootings, excessive force, and now it looks like the tide is turning to where de-escalation might seem cool. Some police departments are starting to reward de-escalation tactics. So 40 um, Philadelphia police officers have received awards since December for defusing con conflicts without using le lethal force. The LAPD has created a Preservation of Life Award. So this seems like a good thing. Well, let's just with that part, I, I see it as a good thing. Yeah, I think we got to incentivize these police officers to de escalate. They're so incentivized to just always ratchet up, you know, what's happening. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I love the fact that we're hearing about these pre preservation of life awards and really encouraging. Uh, police officers to dig into their bag of tricks. I mean, not yeah. everything needs to be responded to with force. You have various methods of, um, you know, approaching a situation and trying to, to de-escalate it. And no one's saying that force is never necessary. It's true. We understand that there are certain uh, times where you're going to need to do that, but it can't be in every instance. I read that police officers uh, uh, usually go through, I think, even just around 100, uh, 100 hours of uh, training related to, like, weapons training and things yeah. like that. But when it comes to, um, uh, like, crisis intervention and de-escalation tactics, they only go through about eight hours of training. And so I can only imagine that when you're in one of those intense situations, your if brain is going to go to the first thing, thing where you exactly, spent so much time that you training. spent so much time yeah. um, and where mm -hmm. your training was heavily, heavily based. Yeah. And so to at least increase some of the de-escalation training so that they are, are digging into a, a, a varied arsenal of, of, of ways to approach a situation, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing and how I, that I, impacts the activities really of the department. Uh, and I think it's going to incre increase the relationship with the community because if I, as a member of the community, know that you pride yourself on your de-escalation awards and you pride yourself on preserving life, I'm going to be a lot le more likely to deal with you on a, a very civil, respectful yeah. basis because I know that you respect me and my life and that you're trying to earn awards for <laughs> making my life better. So interestingly enough, not everybody mm -hmm. is super impressed with these awards. Um, the, uh, a, the Los Angeles Police Union called the award a terrible idea. Here's a quote. It suggests that officers must go above and beyond their normal activities to avoid harm. Or put another way, that officers will be penalized for resorting to an appropriate lawful use of force. That was LA Police Protective League's Board of Directors that, on that, a blog post in November. That, that mine sounds a bit contradictory to me, yeah. that they're being penalized or they would be penalized for the appropriate use of force. The whole point with a lot of these issues is the fact that they're using excessive force. They're shooting people who are, who are un, unarmed. How is that a, being penalized for the appropriate use of force? Yeah. Comments like this make it so like, oh shoot, now I understand why this is so common. Yeah. Unbelievable that this would be the attitude towards it. 
to take to try and take it down and make it sound like a, a bad idea because you're incentivizing people with an award. Well, and he uses the term go above and beyond <laughs> when <laughs> the edict of the police is to protect <laughs> and serve. So normal yeah. activities is to just shoot first and ask, exactly. contemplate later. I mean, that's the normal activities. That's a very interesting thing to say. If anyone should be going above and beyond, it should be our police force. I think we should yeah. put the onus on them to be uh, thoughtful about how, how they are using force and what are the various ways to do it. You can speak to a person. You can use, you know, hands, use physical force. Yeah. There's tasers. You can tase and them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but nowhere in this de-escalation story have we talked about actually penalizing people who don't. This is all yeah. about awarding people. people. Mm -hmm. yeah. That so yeah, I fun, it, funny that it even took that direction. I agree. Yeah. And it's like I remember when I was reading this story and I started thinking about if you guys remember the McKinney, Texas pool party. Oh yes. The kids in their bathing suits and <laughs> the swimming officer trunks, who did somersaults who did his, took his out his gun, pointed his <laughs> gun at the at these teenagers at the at the party. I mean, these mm -hmm. are the precise types of situations where you would expect a police officer to first off you use communication that should be your yeah. first one there's yeah. in that instance i can't even imagine under what why like you would even need to draw above your the situation gun. it's a bunch of kids at a pool exactly yeah. so i think no one's saying that um, police officers should you know doubt themselves right we understand that they have to make split second decisions and sometimes yeah. it can yeah. be life or death and no one's saying that they need to put themselves in harm way but i think we can say like at least in the case of the McKinney Texas case uh, in the case of Tamir Rice where the police officers just roll up roll up you know, and, and shot yeah. him down without anything. I mean, we, I think there are definitely certain examples that we can point to where using kind of forethought and, and, and de-escalation de tactics, I mean, in that situation, there wasn't even anything to escalate, right. um, that, that it can be useful. Do you agree and, with this statement that it prioritizes the lives of suspected criminals? The funny thing is, like, suspected criminals, that could be any of us. Anybody can be I, suspected of a crime virtually I, at any time. And I think it just, pri I think it does, it prioritizes life. Period, mm -hmm. and that's what it should be. Life should be the priority as a police officer is sustaining life, not taking it away. I, I liked what the police commissioner said. He said, "Of course, the officer's safety and the officer's ability to go home is paramount. Absolutely. But if everybody can go home, if that's possible, let's see if we can make that happen." Yeah. I, I, I don't. Yeah, I think it's. Just, I think it's a positive thing. I think yeah. it, it, it's going to spread to other officers because if you know that you're in the car or other officers are showing up to the scene who are the guy that won the uh, Save the Life Award and they, yeah. and they pride themselves on that, it's going to yeah. change your behavior. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully you are right. All right, here's another um, attempt to change the behavior of police. The city of Minneapolis is considering a ballot measure that would go on the ballot in November that would have cops carry professional liability insurance and pay for premium increases if the officer... Uh, engages in official misconduct. Hmm. I like this idea. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think it's great. I, I mean, I like the idea. I, I you know, m many other professions carry professional liability pro insurance. Attorneys have to. Yeah. Attorneys do. Doctors. Um, doctors do. Yeah. So it's not unusual. I think what is unusual in this case is that usually, it, for example, a doctor who's employed by a hospital, usually it's going to be the hospital that's paying um, for the insurance and paying those premiums. Um, and so to the extent that a police officer himself needs to pay the difference well, in... Well, my well, understanding... He, he won't pay. The city will pay unless he right. commits Right, unless he commits the mis He pays the difference of the increase. Right. That makes sense to me. That oh. makes sense to me as well. My question is, how does that impact those who are joining the police force? If I know that I'm now going to be held, potentially, held liable... I, First off, maybe maybe you I'm should living, always maybe know I'm, that you're going to be held yeah. liable. Attorneys know that we're going to be held liable if we do yeah. something wrong. Doctors know it. It, it might Even, cause me. It might cause me to go to another city. Well, but does it cause where I know you, that I don't have that? Um, there's not that risk that I'm now going to have money taken out of my paycheck, or I'm going to have to but, have this extra. That expense. is a good point, and that's I, why it should probably be across <laughs> the board. But I think what you'll see is if that were in some districts and others, I think you'd also see people in those ones that they didn't have them. They'd either be migrating or definitely protesting to, to get it there yeah because 
it's probably going to make be a more unsafe place if it's attracting people who are trying to avoid insurance yeah. for liability. I mean, we're all. I mean, just we all carry liability insurance if yeah. you drive a car, right? And you're uh, going to pay more if you are a bad driver. Yeah. I think some of the criticism has come. Uh, again, the police unions. I don't know. I used to have such <laughs> respect for these police unions, and then I started seeing what they said, and I'm like, what the? All right. So, president of the police union, Lieutenant Bob Kroll, said that officers are not going to get out of their cars for anything. The hard workers, this is a quote, the aggressive workers, the ones I would like policing my neighborhood are the ones that also get the complaints because they're having the contacts with people. If you impose ridiculous things like that, the officer's solution is career preservation. This guy is missing the point because getting a complaint against you is not the same thing as being found guilty of and, misconduct. And I, I, but I kind of want officers to be walking around thinking about career preservation as they're also policing the streets. I, I want them to have that thought in their mind. Long-term thinking. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I, I want to know, I mean, what's going to happen? Like, is it when they, what is the threshold? So we know, that is it going to be that they have to pay, you know, this higher premium when there's a complaint or is it going to be when they are, it's whenever they're uh, when they investigate? To pay out. Yeah. Okay. So, so I guess they would have okay, to so be... So it would have to be something that's like uh, investigated, determined, adjudicated, yeah. and only then the officer would... Uh, yeah, because the insurance is not going to raise your premium unless they have to pay out. You know, so... I mean, you can... you can Other drivers, I'm sure, complain about me all the time. I actually don't know that I think I'm a decent <laughs> driver. But it's not that if other drivers complain about me that my insurance premium goes up. It's, it's when there's an accident and she's tickets. found liable and... Yeah. So in the liability... I mean, I, 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 I like the idea of police officers being held accountable for their actions or, or having an incentive to um, be, be a bit more careful of how they're dealing with the community and dealing with suspected yeah. criminals and things like that. I definitely like that element. I think hopefully it should be coupled with also other alternatives, whether it is, um, you know, you, if, if, if the idea is to reduce the amount of violence that's happening against people in the community or reducing the use of excessive force, I think you can also achieve that with, you know, police cameras, um, making sure that uh, police officers in the community are actual members of the community. I think we remember with Ferguson, it was a community with, that was 66% black, but um, virtually. The, the, the police force was virtually all Zero, white. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that being um, paired with the de-escalation training, I think there should be a number of initiatives that go into yeah, play. Right. I also think the authors of this ballot measure have said that other things like police review boards and anything that stays internal doesn't really yield any results or doesn't change any behavior. And so that's why they want, like, a third party, like an insurance and company. And the importance of this is it would take away the city settling a lot of these suits and having yes. to pay out from the city. So now, uh, taxes is great, so now they can use that for other places, but yeah. a lot of times the city, because of these settlements, will really advocate on behalf of the police and not really have an independent investigation the way it should be because they're looking at their own pocket. Such a good point. So I think it's going to really at least free up the city to have investigations that are truly independent. Yeah, I mean, uh, from 2012 to 2015, Minneapolis paid out $6.6 .6 million dollars. Yeah. That's a huge chunk of change that could have gone Lots to... Of social programs in different mm -hmm. areas. Right. And, and that's at the end of the day, that's coming out of taxpayer money. And, I, and I'm sure that that was also coupled with probably marketing campaigns and having to speak to different people and try to raise certain issues yeah. to make the city look better. So they, they spend a lot of money on that sort of public um, PR campaign. Yeah. I mean, I usually, I'm not like a huge, the biggest fan of, of uh, insurance. we got to pay all, you know, and yeah. it's it can be expensive. And whatever. But in this case... Yeah, and given that they're getting it for free. It's just only if their premium goes up due to something that they're found liable on right. and they're paying the difference. Right. I like it. Minneapolis, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today on Justice is Served. Don't forget to like, comment. You can reach out to us, me, at Chelsea Galicia on uh, Twitter and Instagram. You can find me at Shaka Strong on Twitter and Instagram. And you can find me at Ayamiams on Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> Very soon, in like 30 seconds yeah. soon. Right, we'll start we'll see you all around. next week. Thanks Bye for joining guys. us on Justice is Served. <laughs> From executives Kevin Undergaro, Dario Kristen, Tiana Hobson, and the entire BHL staff, we would like to thank you for supporting Black Hollywood Live the first online broadcast network dedicated to African-American entertainment. For questions and comments, contact us. Info at blackhollywoodlive.com. Like us on Facebook.
tweet us or Instagram us at BHL Online. And I am the official voice of Black Hollywood Live. Scipio, Instagram me at King XO Bay. Thanks for tuning in. Hollywood redefined. The views expressed here are those of the host owner and do not necessarily reflect the views of BHL or its owners or principals.